Let's cover some techniques to optimize your game assets using Blender. We'll reduce memory usage and computing resources. By doing so, you'll be able to get more assets into your environment, improve frame rates, and have more creative freedom without performance constraints. We'll look at topology, baking, and a bonus tip to get more out of your texture resolution. We'll be using Blender for this entire process. The focus here is on optimizing assets for use in a game engine. If you want to learn how to create 3D assets from scratch in Blender, I recommend CG Cookie's Press Start Asset Creation course. Let's start with our assets topology. Topology is the geometry and structure of our model. While I model, I like to keep a few topology tips in mind. The first one is to localize geometry. What I mean by that is when I add additional loops or edges for whatever the reason, I try to keep that extra geometry local just to where I need it. So this extra loop, for instance, I can localize by getting out my knife tool and redirecting the edge flow and dissolving the extra edges with control X. The second tip is to dissolve edges that don't contribute to the object silhouette. For example, I'm to a point where I want to apply one subdivision level on this mesh. That's given me some more geometry in areas where I need it. In addition to that though, it's also given me extra geometry where I don't necessarily need it, like these loops here. See how when I dissolve them, it doesn't really alter the form or silhouette of the model? If you're not sure, you can always dissolve and toggle back and forth with undo and redo to see if the dissolved edge makes a difference in the object's form. The third topology tip is to break up the mesh. Take the TV's antenna, for instance. We could inset the top of the TV, add some extra loops, and extrude up into a new cylinder shape. That's a lot of new points and edges though, just for a simple antenna. Instead, we can leave the top of the TV surface flat and just add in a new cylinder that intersects with it. Since we don't need to see the bottom of the cylinder, we can delete that face. We have less geometry now since we didn't try and blend everything together, but at a slight cost. One, the texture space on the top of the TV is not totally utilized now since the antenna covers a section of it. Two, if we get really close up to this intersecting geometry, it might look a bit off. I'll help counteract that with some ambient occlusion in the texture. Another example of separating the mesh for optimization is this vent at the back of the TV. We want to have a lot of geometry back here, but it'd be really challenging to blend from the vent to the main TV body where there's less geometry. Rather than try to deal with that headache, I modeled it as a disconnected mesh. Not only is this easier, but it's actually more realistic too. When a manufacturer creates a TV like this, they're not molding it out of one solid connected chunk. In reality, it's made up of panels and different sections of various materials. I should clarify that this can still be one joined object and can still be laid out in a single UV space, but the mesh itself doesn't have to be connected at every vertice. I hope that makes sense. Now we've dealt with topology, it's time to turn our attention to optimizing textures. We'll do that with texture baking. I've UV unwrapped our model so everything is laid out in a single UV space. Different parts of the TV are made up of different materials. While it's alright to texture with a number of different materials, we want to simplify this down to one single set of baked maps. One single material will be less draw calls or less for the engine to think about when it's displaying our asset. To texture, I used a procedural method, which is amazing to use, but it's slow to render in real time and can't be exported out of Blender to a game engine. So we'll convert these multiple procedural materials to one single baked material. Baking takes all of our ingredients, in this case nodes, and outputs an image of the final result. It's important to note that texture baking for game assets should take place after triangulation. This is just a good safe practice as it ensures all of our polygons are triangulated in a controlled and predictable manner, preventing vertex normals from being changed down the road. So let's add a triangulate modifier and for good measure, apply it. If you're worried about this destructive step, you can always duplicate your object and store the backup in a disabled collection. To bake into one image, naturally we need to add that one image. Now we have it, we need to tell it how big this image should be. I'll go ahead and make this a standard 4K map. If you don't know, that's 4096 pixels in each dimension. To keep things organized, let's call this TV 4K base color. Since we want to bake the base color of all of our materials down to one single map, we'll copy this image with Control C and go to each material and paste it with Control V. When you paste the image in the next material, you'll see a little number 2 next to the title. 
Anytime you see this in Blender, it's telling us that there are two users using one data set. In this case, there are two node networks using the same image. This shared image system is how we're going to bake multiple materials into one image. When we paste it again, we can see it's now used by three places and so on. So changes we make to one image will transfer to all of them. Now Blender's baking system is selection sensitive, so select the object we're baking, the TV. Then in each material, we need to specify what information we're baking. What we can do with Blender's Node Wrangler add-on enabled is press Control shift left click to solo a particular section of the node network. All that does is plugs that channel straight into the material output. So we're just looking at the base color emitting from the object and nothing else. Let's solo the base color on each material. So we have our object selected, we have our base color information isolated. Now all we need to do is select the image we're baking to. That's just the 4K image we created. In the render properties now, under the bake section, set the bake type to emit. We're doing that because we isolated the base color we wanted by plugging it straight into the surface output. It's as if it's emitting that information, so we'll bake the emit value. Now press bake. Our new baked image shows up just like a rendering in our image viewer. This little star here is letting us know this image hasn't been saved yet. To save it, just go to image and save and choose a location. This is also where you can choose the file type and the bit depth, compression level, and all of that good stuff. For optimization, I'll keep mine at 8-bit and save the image. Repeat this exact process for baking a normal map, but instead of a mitt, we'll actually set that bake type to normal. Now for our last baking optimization. Color maps like the base color and normal maps use all three red, green, and blue channels. Single channel maps use just one channel and can be represented in a range from black to white. Some examples of single channel maps are the metallic map, roughness, and ambient occlusion. To save on the number of maps we have, a common trick in game development is something called channel packing. In channel packing, we take three single channel maps and pack them into the red, green, and blue channels of a color image. To do that, we'll simply add a new node in each material called Combine Color. As we can see, it receives three single channel maps and outputs one color map. So solo out that node with control shift left click. Nothing's plugged into it yet, so it should just be black. For the red channel, let's plug in our material's metallic value. For green, let's grab the roughness, and for blue, go ahead and drop in the ambient occlusion. Do this for each of the materials. This is just like we did when we baked the base color map. Our new map is called channel pack. Set the bake type to emit, and we're ready to go. Don't forget to save the image after it's been baked. My last optimization tip is pretty simple, but often overlooked. Let's open up Blender's compositor. Check use nodes, and let's take the base color map we just baked and drop it in. Make sure your output resolution is set to the map resolution, 4096 by 4096. And the scene's color management is just set to standard. We don't want to apply a color transform like Filmic since our map is already baked. Now before the output, let's slide in a filter node. Set that filter to Diamond Sharpen. The default value of one can be pretty intense, so just eyeball something that gives your map a bit more of a crispy edge without looking overly sharp. I'm showing you this because oftentimes a bit of sharpening, though a simple step, can help you get away with lower resolution maps. For example, on the left we have a 4K image without sharpening, and on the right we have a 2K image with sharpening. Amazing how a 2K image can be lower resolution but appear to be higher resolution than an unsharpened 4K image. Use this tip with care, but it's a good one to keep in mind. And that's it for my game asset optimization tips. Here's our final asset in Blender, but of course, we built this with the intention of bringing it into a game engine, which it's fully set up to do now. If you want to use the channel packed textures we created in Blender, you can just use a separate color node. Remember, metallic was red, roughness green, and ambient occlusion blue. Blender is a powerful tool. There's always more to cover, especially as development continues, so make sure to subscribe here on CG Cookie for more. I'm Riley Brown, and this has been three ways to optimize your game assets using Blender. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on a future video.